Catherine Douglas Honecky, who is a minister in Tiburon, who has also written books on altruism and moral courage, which is the subject for next week. This is the hopeful and inspiring side of the Holocaust, so I encourage you to come next week. It looks like we're about as ready as we'll ever be to begin. You wonder what, uh, I'm not a Japanese like the rest of these up here, what I'm doing up here. It's my job to introduce these good people, and I'm privileged to do that because I had a little experience with the Japanese occupation. I recently attended the 50th anniversary of the, my graduation from San Francisco Theological Seminary. While we were down there, we were reminiscing, and one of the students said, do you remember who it bought the car from, the car I called Clarabelle? No, nobody remembered. But he said, the one thing, two things I remember about that car, it ran like a top, and it had a trunk big enough to hold a Howard Toriyumi. That was during the occupation time, and uh, Howard was restricted to San Anselmo and could not go to San Francisco for his weekend work and to visit his fiancée. So a couple of weeks, Miner would put him in the trunk and take him into San Francisco, and he would uh, spend a few hours with his fiancée, and then he'd put him in the trunk and bring him back to San Anselmo. They say love conquers all with a little help. <laughs> the, um, then I was called in at the beginning of, uh, this, before the summer of 1942, <laughs> Uh, called in the office at seminary. I had put in a request for anyone knew a place where I could live during the summer. And I was offered the opportunity to live in one of the two houses that belonged to the Japanese Presbyterian Church in San Francisco as a, a caretaker for the summer, rent-free. That's what attracted me. But that was quite an interesting experience. That house, big old pre-earthquake house on the corner of Post and Octavia, two houses, all the closets and all the small rooms had heavy hasps and padlocks on the doors. They contained washers, typewriters, bicycles, stoves, refrigerators that belonged to the Japanese members of the congregation and some others who were not given a reasonable amount of time to dispose of their belongings before they were summarily shipped out. We had several attempted break-ins that summer, but uh, none of them succeeded, thank goodness. So I was acutely aware of the unfairness because you see these people who were evacuated, they may, they may have been Japanese, but they were my fellow church members, my classmates, and my friends. And I was not happy with anybody doing what this government did to my friends. And I have been really unhappy with the length of time it has taken for the government to own up to the fact that they might have made a mistake and try to do something about it. I'm sure we'll hear a little more about this later. So I am privileged to introduce to you three people. Beginning on the left, James Murakani, an engineer, consulting engineer in Santa Rosa. He was born in Santa Rosa graduate of UC Berkeley. He has two children, one of whom is a psychologist for the county of Sonoma. His wife, uh, a teaching assistant in Forestville. I miss the other child. I miss the other child. Oh, girl. <laughs> girl. She's back east. Uh, Mr. Murakami is uh, past president of the Japanese American Citizens League, which certainly gives him good qualifications to speak to us. Then in the middle, May Nakano, an author, lives in Sebastopol, born in Colorado. She is the author of the book, Japanese American Women, which is in the library here and is available in bookstores, and I am told is an excellent book and good reading for us. On the other end, Professor Robert Fuchigami. I'm sure some of you know him. Uh, professor Emeritus at Sonoma State University, where he was a member of the uh, Education Department faculty. He was born in Marysville, California. And I'm sure he has a family too, but, but we didn't have time to get the specifications on that. So with two children. So with this introduction, I'd like to call on, um, oh, come on, Harvey, don't blow the name. 
Dr. Steiner, <laughs> to give us a sense of direction and purpose for this meeting. Yeah. Old, old age is catching up with me. I don't like it, but I like the option even less. My introduction will be uh, very brief, and uh, what I'm trying to uh, say here is primarily in a form of ad admonishment. Uh, most of you are younger generation and uh, not altogether dreadfully informed about uh, contemporary history. So uh, let me just say uh, very few things which might refresh your memory, that is if your memory is stored with the type of history, we'll be very privileged to uh, listen and see today. So we have here in these three human beings in front of you, representatives of the uh, Japanese American community who were interned during World War II in so-called internment camps. Japanese Americans who experienced these camps called them frequently concentration camps. To be sure, there was a difference between German and American camps. However, both are inexcusable and never should have been allowed to come into being in the first place. In 1990, I was conducting research in Germany and traveled with a camera crew to produce a, a doc movie, Hitler Man and Myth, it was called. We asked citizens in Western countries if someone like Hitler would be possible today in their respective countries. All said no, of course. It could not happen here. Couldn't it? It happened in this country during World War II, that American citizens were stripped of their rights and possessions, and stripped of their personal freedom, humiliated and made to live in camps under conditions which were and are inexcusable. So yes, not only can it happen here, but it happened in a democracy to boot, and not in a dictatorship. American citizens of Japanese were forced to suffer and live under inhuman conditions. And I think we should be very much aware of the fact that this happened here. And not in Germany, not in the former Soviet Union, but right here. What are you going to do about it to prevent it in the future? And your behavior your attitude, your knowledge can prevent it or can make it happen. Remember that. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting us to the Holocaust Lecture Series. We're pleased to be here because all of us need to remember our past, lest we repeat our mistakes. Last listen to members of the 522nd Field Artillery Battalion. They talked about the liberation of inmates at Dachau. You learned that some of those Nisei soldiers, those American liberators, were themselves at one time inmates of concentration camps, except those camps were in the United States of America. Some of those Nisei families or soldiers still had families, fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters in those camps at the time of the liberation at Dachau. This afternoon, the three of us who were incarcerated in those American concentration camps are here to share our thoughts and experiences with you. The pre presentation will be in three parts. Uh, we want a videotape and then each of us would like to say a few words 
and then we'll open it up for questions. <coughs> We'd like to begin our presentation with a videotape entitled Days of Waiting. Ironically, one of the liberators of, of, the, of Dachau, uh, his son produced this film, Days of Waiting. Now, the film summarizes location and incarceration experience as it was experienced by a white person. Not all of us who were in the camps were Japanese American. There were a few who were married to Japanese Americans. And so we thought it would be appropriate to show this to you because the audience is primarily white. The person is still Ishigo. She was an artist and a writer who happened to be married to a Japanese American. She also wrote a very interesting book called Lone Heart Mountain. And they were in that camp at Heart Mountain, Wyoming. So let's show the film, Days of Waiting, by Stephen Okazaki. Kara, it was so good hearing from you after all these years. I, too, have thought many times about our days in camp and the friends we had back then. Yes, I have considered writing about my experiences, my childhood, why I went to Garther, and what it was like during and after the war. So, for the record, this is my story. I was born in 1899 in Oakland, California. A year later, we moved to San Francisco, where father worked as a landscape painter and piano tuner. When I was 12, we moved to Los Angeles, and my parents sent me to live with a procession of relatives and strangers. It was an unhappy time. I was raped by one of my guardians who threatened to put me in an institution if I told. Back then, people who caused trouble were put away. After high school, I ran away from home. I roamed the streets alone, looking for adventure. Those were wild years. Eventually, I settled down and went to art school. I wanted to be a painter, like my father. In 1929, I met Arthur Ishigo. It was love at first sight. Born in San Francisco, Arthur had moved to Los Angeles to become an actor. He got a few bit parts, but ended up as a janitor at Paramount Studios. It was against the law for Caucasian women to marry non-Caucasian men in California. 
So we drove down to Mexico for our wedding. My family disowned me for good this time. Those days, there was a lot of pregnant marriages like ours. So we stayed in the Japanese community and tried not to draw attention to ourselves. To get away, we went camping in the mountains as often as we could. Those were good times. I was happy. The Japanese had immigrated to America before the turn of the century to make better lives for themselves, children. They worked as miners, railroad workers, and farm hands. And by 1940, many of them had begun to prosper. That all came to an end in 1941. On December 7th, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and President Roosevelt declared war on Japan. Although there was not a single act of espionage or sabotage by a Japanese American, the newspapers and politicians cried for their removal and imprisonment. They voiced their loyalty to the United States, but no one would listen. On December 8th, one day after Pearl Harbor, Paris charged Arthur and all of the other Japanese Americans at the studio. Two weeks later, I was fired from my job as a teacher at the Hollywood Art Center because of my Japanese name. We were American citizens, but we were treated as if we were the enemy. Under the cover of wild rumors and concentration camps under army supervision, more than 110,000 Japanese Americans, the majority of whom were American citizens, fell under these orders. Arthur and I were faced with the choice of separating or going into the camps together. I could not desert him. I wanted to stay with him. Or what happened, no matter where we were sent. We'd been married for 13 years. Neither of us had ever felt a racial barrier, and now society was trying to create one. It seemed like a foul, musty thing dug up from the dark ages. 450 of us gathered at the church that early May morning. We groups with our bundles and baskets piled at the curb. There was no way of knowing what we might need. We were allowed 100 pounds of baggage, no more. Those with more than their allotment had to leave their things lying in the street. It was all so weird and strange. I took out my notepad and began sketching armed military police stepped out and ordered us aboard. As we were driven through the city, a few bystanders stood on the street, staring and pointing at us, nodding their approval. We had no idea of where we were going or what would happen to us. Our new home was called we were less than 25 miles from home, but it felt as if we were in a foreign land. Within a few weeks, more than 5,000 people were delivered to Pomona. We lived in horse stalls and cheap shacks, surrounded by barbed wire and machine gun towers. Each day, in great long lines to get food. Once inside, we ate hastily to make room for all the others hungrily peering in through the windows. There was rarely enough to eat. Some of the young people would run from one mess hall to another to get their fill. Later, we found out that our meat supplies were being diverted from us and sold out of the camp. 
The War Relocation Authority organized an internal police force made up of cooperative camp internees. Every night, they searched the barracks, opened our doors, turned their flashlights on us. All who were able were assigned jobs to maintain the camp. Those who refused to work were blacklisted and threatened with being sent to the worst of the future camps. Nineteen of us volunteered to put together a camp bulletin, the Pomona Center News, with an old hand-turned mimeograph machine. We published stories about camp activities, trying to keep them upbeat, but realistic. On Visitor's Day, we went like prisoners to a fenced area where we could stand and talk for a short time. Under the watchful eyes of armed guards, we spent a few moments with friends and religious people from the outside. But this humiliating segregation, isolating us from our fellow Americans, was not enough. The time had come for us to be sent away in August, we were shipped a thousand miles to Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Heart Mountain held 12,658 internees, living in hundreds of barracks in a square mile enclosure. The people were half hungry and restless. Their feet trampled the earth into a fine dust within the fenced area. It was a city unto itself. Babies were born. Children went to school, made friends, lost friends. A few grew desperate and took their own lives. I wanted to cry out, look what you've done, why? It makes no sense at all. I hoarded scraps of paper and tried to write and draw what I saw. Perhaps one day, someone would want to know. Heart Mountain lording over us as if it held the mystery of our destiny. Long lines of people waiting to be fed. Mothers with their children. The first in September. the icy winds and bitter cold. Shabby, shivering people with patches on their clothes. Christians, Catholics and Buddhists gathering for Sunday services. of people with nothing to do but wait and watch the sunset. Then wait for the next day to begin.
mother and child gazing longingly at the distant horizon. Our homes and our country seemed so far away. Strange as it may sound, in this desolate, lonely place, I felt accepted for the first time in my life. The government had declared me a Japanese, and now I no longer saw myself as white, as a Hakujin. I was a Nihonjin, a Japanese American. My fellow Heart Mountain Reds took me in as one of their own. We all shared the same pain, the same joys, the same hopes and desires, and I never encountered a single act of prejudice or discrimination. We had to make the best of a bad situation. I obtained a violin and joined the camp orchestra and theater troupe, Art Mountain Mandolin Band. When we gave performances, no one could miss me. I was the Hakujin with the white hair. The main thing was to keep busy. I found a camera and took pictures of the camp children. Arthur and I never had children. Arthur worked as a boiler man. Day and he shoveled coal to heat the camp's hot water. When we were first interned, Arthur was strong and alive. In three and a half years, he seemed to have aged 20 years. He grew morose and sentimental. In the evening, he would sit quietly or play his bamboo flute, reminiscing and dreaming, dreaming of what might have been. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. The war ended August of 1945. The nation celebrated and soldiers came home. The War Relocation Authority announced that Heart Mountain would close and that we would be able to leave. Suddenly, we were free. The government told us that we could go anywhere, do anything, take any kind of work we liked. The gate opened, but we had nowhere to go, nothing to go back to. I told Arthur I wanted to record the last day in camp, and he agreed. I hid the drawings I had already done, and we waited for the last train. On November 10th, 1945, given $25, and transportation fare. We were poorly clad, dirty. We marched like prisoners onto the waiting buses and trains. I felt like I was part of a defeated Indian tribe. When we arrived in Los Angeles, there was no friendly greeting or even a smile. Nearly 2,000 of us who could not find jobs or a place to live, who found it difficult to readjust to American society, were hustled into segregated makeshift trailer camps outside the city. We were surrounded by barbed wire, but this time the gate was open. As we moved from one trailer camp to another, I continued to draw and the Japanese American children I lived with. Some of them were ashamed of their heritage. They refused to speak the language of their grandparents and told strangers they were Chinese. Arthur and I took what work we could find to buy food and pay the rent. 
I worked at a cannery in San Pedro. Well, I did odd jobs in Los Angeles. We lived in poverty for several years. I joined another Japanese-American band and continued to be part of the community. We provided entertainment at picnics, church programs, and community events. In 1948, the Attorney General was authorized to settle claims for the personal property losses we suffered. Arthur and I had made a list of everything we had lost when we were put in camp. We hoped to get at least $1,000. In 1952, the government offered us a settlement of $100. I decided I could not accept this amount. And for the next four years, I lobbied and sent letters to every politician and civic leader I could think of. It was to no avail. In 1956, I finally gave up. And with tears in his eyes, Arthur accepted $102.50. One year later, on August 19th, 1957, Arthur passed away from cancer. He was 55 years old. It was strange. I had so much anger inside of me. I wanted to scream and cry, but I couldn't. After Arthur's death, I did a stray cat and moved into an apartment above a store where I could climb up onto the roof and watch the stars. Fifteen years later, the California Historical Society included my artwork in a show devoted to internment camp artists. I was amazed. I had long ago given hope that our story would ever be told. During the run of the exhibit, I thought of Arthur. Our days in Heart Mountain, all that we had been through, and I wept. Dear Cara, sometimes it's so hard to keep smiling, but I keep trying. Things and best wishes, Estelle Ishigo. In 1983, a group of former Heart Mountain internees found Estelle Ishigo in a rundown basement apartment in Los Angeles. She was living on $5 a week for food and had lost both of her legs from gangrene. She was placed in a convalescent hospital in Hollywood.
the uh, videotape that you, sh you just sh saw will be shown at KQED on uh, May 14th and then again on May 30th. It, yes, it was, um, this particular uh, film was, um, was um, won the Academy Award for short documentary. Unfortunately for uh, Estella Shigo and others, uh, the, uh, the money that they talk about in redress uh, would not reach her. What we'd like to do now is to have uh, Jim and May say a few, a few words. Uh, Jim has to go to a um, another meeting, so we're going to have him go first. Thank you, Bob. You know, um, after si this is the first time I've seen that video, but uh, one of my uh, uh, much of the what do you call this thing? Not the slides, but the overhead projector. And uh, taken by uh, uh, train from here to Merced, California, and then uh, finally being transported uh, halfway across the United States uh, and uh, having celebrated my 16th birthday somewhere in the hills of uh, New Mexico, and then uh, the uh, old little write up on on uh, grandfather Mur Murakami. No, I'm the grandfather. This is great grandfather Murakami because uh, I do have grandchildren now, but he did uh, uh, emigrate to the uh, big island of Hawaii in 1900, and uh, apparently. Uh, uh, Toiled in the, went to uh, Colorado, and worked in the. It says the iron works, but I suppose it really means the iron mines. But I'm not sure of that. But anyway, this is the background of my uh, my father or, or great grandfather Murakami. Like all of the other Isseis, or the first generation Japanese, they were. Good. Uh, they had a green thumb, and I didn't in inherit that, unfortunately. Everything I plant seems to uh, wilt and uh, doesn't seem to grow. But at any rate, uh, um, they toiled in the agricultural fields. Now, where you're sitting right now, and I drew this little sketch up to illustrate that this was part of the uh, Waldo Ronert uh, seed farm. and. From Petaloid, which is behind you, over to the freeway, to just about where the uh, uh, Press Democrat building is and uh, so forth. That was the old Redwood Highway going between San Francisco and Eureka. But there used to be uh, approximately three miles of uh, seed plants being grown here at the Walter Ronert uh, seed farm. Many of the first generation Japanese uh, toil uh, at hoeing the, uh, the plants and so forth and, and uh, until they matured to the uh, seed and the products and so forth. But this is typical, I think, of the, the uh, type of uh, uh, livelihood that the first generation Japanese uh, undertook. Uh, it was hard labor. But nonetheless, uh, it did provide and put food on the, on the table. This um, went on, and even though this is uh, very hard work, many of the Isseis uh, managed to save some money. They became very successful farmers, uh, and many of the farmers in the area um, were um, uh, successful apple growers, uh, there are successful chicken farmers and successful strawberry uh, uh, owners and so forth. 
And they were beginning to just uh, uh, beginning to realize the fruits of their labor and so forth until this happened to them. Now this was the evacuation order that ordered us of Japanese ancestry into the uh, so-called centers and this was tacked on every uh, telephone pole uh, in Sonoma County and probably Mendocino County. <clears throat> there were no Japanese in uh, uh, Eureka to my knowledge. There are now, but there were uh, Japanese in uh, Mendocino County, Marin County, and all the way up and down the coast and to Oregon and Washington. And on every, just told us to report to get there. And somehow or the other, we being very dutifully uh, obedient, you might say, uh, obeyed the order and there we were at that designated time to be incarcerated. This is a picture of my grandson. He, <laughs> being a doting grandfather, you might have known. He'd brag about it. See uh, what would happen if that were to occur during the present time. Some of these you've already seen, but this was the so-called, quotes, face of the enemy that the, the reason was the government gave us that we were being incarcerated. Little girl there, um, sitting there very forlornly. Uh, mother gave her an apple, and probably to, um, uh, you know, to quiet her. The other scene is some blind uh, people being uh, escorted off of a, a train, and I don't know where they were going from there, but they were um, guarded by that sergeant with the sidearm, 45 sidearm on his. Uh, on his hip. This was again more seen of the uh, evacuation. Uh, those who were lame, critically ill, uh, were still uh, being um, uh, put into uh, segregated areas and so forth and guarded. The bottom scene was uh, showing the troops on one side and those of us who were being herded onto the trains on the other side. The, um, I don't know whether this is very clear or not, but this shows the locations of the uh, 10 relocation centers uh, throughout the United States, starting with Manzanar, which many of you heard about, Tule Lake up in the northwestern part of California. Uh, in uh, Arizona, there are three camps, really. Poston was uh, broken up into three camps, Poston 1, 2, and 3, and Gila. And then uh, there was a camp in Topi Topaz, Utah, Minidoka uh, in Idaho, Heart Mountain, which Estelle Ishigo was uh, incarcerated in, Amachi, Colorado, which uh, the three of us up here were incarcerated. In fact, uh, Maine Shai Nakano were the first uh, uh, youngsters to be married in Amachi. So they're here with us this afternoon. Um, the other two camps were in Arkansas, one at Roar and the other one at Jerome. So this is the locations of the incarceration or the uh, relocation centers in the United States. a little bit out of sequence, but uh, this was the, the typical uh, mess hall scene in which the uh, uh, evacuees uh, sat down and, and ate community style. I can still remember my mother having tears flowing down her eyes at the first meal that we received in the assembly center. and. Uh, I know now the reason why she was crying because she uh, really, it was the first time in her life that she didn't prepare a meal for the family. Secondly, she knew uh, that for the first time her family was be going to be fed something to eat, which we didn't know anything about. So I just thought I'd, I'd show that scene of the mess hall.
These are more scenes of the uh, relocation center up the top, the, uh, the guard towers. Uh, I don't know whether, oh, that was at Tule Lake, but most of the assembly centers had those guard towers and searchlights and uh, uh, sentries uh, guarding us with machine guns as if we were going to uh, uh, escape in man there. But uh, nonetheless, that was the atmosphere in the assembly centers. This was at Tule Lake, one of the relocation centers. The other two scenes are, uh, again, the mess hall, and uh, it must be mealtime, I'm dwelling on that mess hall business. But at any rate, the other one was the uh, sleeping quarters of the uh, typical evacuees. This was, again, the assembly center. In the uh, relocation centers, for the first year, I graduated from the, uh, the uh, uh, internment uh, relocation center high school and uh, got my high school diploma there. Uh, it was very interesting because when I went to the University of California to transfer uh, uh, my credits from the uh, junior college, I just uh, very routinely put down that I graduated from Amachi, Colorado. And uh, so they, uh, UC Berkeley, uh, was researching and uh, verifying my educational record and they called me into the registrar's office after I got down there and was enrolled and they said um, uh, we tried to verify your high school education and uh, show that that particular photograph is that it was very ironic because uh, they would uh, be classes uh, every day but each morning, we would uh, stand there and pledge allegiance to the United States. Um, even though at that time, we were doing it more, by, my, more out of habit than anything else. I um, do it many times. I often think, I don't know whether May and Shai went through San Andino or not, but they would be familiar with that scene. Anyway, that's all that I have to say about the Japanese-American experience. Uh, May Nakano says, you're eating into my time, so I'll, <laughs> I'll better give it to, the mic to her. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to, can you hear me? Yes, no? How's this? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to come at this um, business of the wartime uh, camps in the United States from a very personal point of view. But before I do that, I want to tell you that I do appreciate that I have to talk about uh, this subject. And uh, to paraphrase uh, a statement made by that remarkable human being, Ellie Wiesel at the um, uh, memorial uh, dedication for a Holocaust in Washington uh, the other day. He said something like, it is important to keep memory alive. It's even more, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, uh, it takes a lot of priming and a lot of changing of uh, attitudes in order for that to happen. Imagine being a child in a classroom when your face is the only Asian face in the class. And the teacher uh, reminds you in very subtle ways uh, that you are different. And she's short because her mother was short. It's part of what I am and it's part of my heritage. But of course I don't say that. I don't say that because I'm shy and I am embarrassed. And secondly, because in my, with my child's intuition, I know that she knows that that is the case. So as a child, I am in this instance together with other signals that the teacher is giving out. And I'm coming to the conclusion that this person that I admire greatly 
does not like me because of my Japanese face. And since she does not like me, there must be something wrong with me. And that becomes a kind of pattern which uh, happens over and over again. Still, you know, it wouldn't be so bad if that ended with the teacher. What happens then is that the children quickly take on the attitude of the, of the teacher. Even as I am the best speller in class, I am never the captain of the spelling team. And at recess, I am never elected to be a leader in one of those games, even though I am a tomboy, got a lot of uh, competitive spirit. And I dread Valentine's Day, because in those days, we used to all exchange Valentines, and the person that uh, got the most Valentines was declared to be the most popular person and very much revered. Um, simple things in those times. But I, I knew that I would pro Well, I use this experience of mine as an analog to institutionalized racism and how that worked to bring about uh, the camp experience in the United States. Like the teacher, government uh, leaders have a great deal to do with shaping attitudes of the people. And they have the resources and uh, a lot of power in which to do that. Uh, my father was a farmer. Uh, he could not buy land because he was not a citizen. And he was not a citizen because Asians were not, alien Asians were not allowed to become uh, naturalized like other citizens. I think I'll do better with this here. My mother was among the last female immigrants from Japan since uh, after 1920, immigration for Japanese women was cut off entirely. Um, because of our immigration policies against uh, Japan. In 1940, my family moved to the city, but we could not live anywhere we wanted to uh, because of the large-scale practice of putting restrictive covenants on the deeds which uh, disallowed uh, Asian and other people of color to live in certain areas. And I didn't aspire to go to college then because I knew that most professions, even teaching, was not open to me. So in 1940, I am a teenager, and I know through the grapevine what eateries I can go to, uh, what uh, places of recreation will be open to me, and uh, I know what uh, places will turn me away. Occasionally, though, I make a little blunder, like the time my girlfriend and I went to a soda fountain in a five and 10 cent store. Those of you who are my age can probably relate to that, but I don't think we have soda fountains in five and 10 anymore. Uh, anyway, we sat there on the stool, and it quickly became apparent to us that we were not going to be served because we have had this kind of experience before but it's very awkward to get up and walk away. But finally we did slink away, hoping that uh, nobody noticed it, us. Well, all of these small incidents, some subtle and some very overt, coupled with the larger instances of racism like um, numerous racist slogans that, and slurs that are put out daily by the uh, different media uh, loom large in my psyche. I am reminded over and over again that I count less than others in this society. So that my sense of self, self has been so damaged that I am uh, paralyzed. I'm also angry. But I look at my mother and I look at my father and I see that they have endured a lot more than I have and uh, with a lot of patience and also with an attitude of uh, it really can't be helped. 
and so take on their attitude. Well, it's small wonder then, when uh, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor uh, and the authorities ordered us into camp that we all went into camp without a whimper. There were uh, three men who refused to go, two for reasons of principle and one for personal reasons. Uh, they were the only ones. The rest of us simply went. Um, it was sort of like a fit, a real fit culmination to the history that we had experienced in the country. Well, you've seen the uh, kinds of experiences that we uh, went through in the camps by the film and by uh, Jim's uh, um, overheads here. So I, I about my experiences there. And I really don't want to leave you with the impression that I am still feeling victimized. I should tell you that uh, post-war, many of us uh, began to our slow recovery. And then during the uh, era when the women's uh, rights movement and the civil rights movement came upon the scene, uh, it, it liberated me uh, while I was like in my 40s. And uh, I began, became um, a, to, I came to realize all of this, uh, these facts and this experience that I had been denying uh, before. And uh, I'd, at this point, I want to also make uh, sure that we realize this, what an impact that society has upon us. I mean, it, the, the fact that society said I was now okay made me feel okay about myself. And that, that is really very critical. But, but what a waste. All that energy and money and human resources wasted to, um, investing in racial hate. Uh, again, I heard, uh, I hear Ellie uh, Weasel's voice on the um, uh, television the other day saying, turning around to the president and saying, we have to do something. We have to do something. And he was talking then about the terrible tragedy that's going on here today. Uh, taking on the responsibility, really, of, um, of saying that. Finally, what I have learned from this memory is what Ellie Wiesel was talking about, that we all need to take responsibility to uh, see that we can do everything possible to, to try to eliminate acts of hatred based on f uh, race or in ethnicity or uh, any of those other categories that um, uh, is that prejudice is directed against. So I thank the um, Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust and the Sonoma State University Holocaust Study Center for putting on this. Canada put in 12, 12, over 12,000 of its citizens into camps. Peru sent uh, hundreds and hundreds of their citizens to the United States uh, and placed them into internment camps in Texas. My wife, Sally, said to keep my presentation short. And in order to do that, I had to write it down. Otherwise, I'd go on and on. I don't know whether I can summarize three and a half years in 10 minutes, but let me try. The videotape that you saw depicted Heart Mountain, Wyoming. The three of us were in Amachi, Colorado. I was 12 years old when my family and I were sent by train to Amachi. We came, we ended up uh, in the same assembly center with Jim. Uh, you know, we from the Central Valley, he was from here in Sebastopol. We shouldn't have been there in the first place, but that's another story. And you can see it in films, and you can see it in books. 
Amachi was situated about 15 miles from the Kansas border, almost 100 miles north of the Oklahoma, Oklahoma state line. It's that Dust Bowl area, if any of you have been there. The camp covered an area, a mile square, to hold 8,000 persons. The land was semi-desert, with lots of sand and sagebrush, cactus, and tumbleweed. The land was suitable for lizards and beetles, rattlesnakes, desert tortoise, and jackrabbits, not for human beings. I remember some summertime temperatures over 100 degrees and some winter nights below freezing. The clothing we had brought from California was in for the climatic, climatic conditions we encountered. But then, none of us knew that our final destination was to be Colorado. At the time of our arrival, Amachi was still under construction, although the barbed wire fence surrounding the camp was in place. The sentry guard towers were already up and operating. Military police were stationed at the camp entrance to check and control persons and vehicles entering or leaving camp. The camp perimeter was patrolled by arm, armed guards on, on jeeps. As the months and years went by, the armed patrols were discontin discontinued and the sentry towers were abandoned. After all, where could we go even if we escaped? We, we were easily identifiable by our features and wouldn't get very far before being captured. The camp itself was composed primarily of army barracks and rows of barracks clustered 12 barracks to a block. Each block would accommodate approximately 300 evacuees. Each block had a mess hall consisting of a central kitchen and a common eating area. Each block had separate toilet and shower facilities for men and women. To the dismay of the evacuees, there were no individual partitions in those facilities, so there was no privacy. You sat on a toilet seat, and there was no one sitting next to you. The women complained bitterly over this lack of privacy, so partitions were eventually built. Each block had a laundry area complete with scrub boards for washing clothes. There were no washing machines or dryers. Each barrack was divided into six, li six living units, which were euphemistically called apartments. Each un living unit was made by 20 or less. There was no running water in the units, no sink, no bathroom, no electrical outlets, Except for some canvas cots to sleep on, there was no furniture in the room, no chairs, no table, nothing. Heating was in the form of a pot-bellied stove that burned coal. We were each given a thin mattress, full of army blankets, and a small pillow. Remember, we went into the camps with two suitcases. Our family of 10, large family, was assigned to two apartments in Block 7G, Barrack 9. Our address for the next three and a half years would be 7G 9C, or 7G 9D, Amachi, Colorado. We spent our first few days in camp on scavenge to the camp construction wood pile to get scraps of wood and bent nails so that we could make some crude furniture, a table, some chairs, and a low partition to to provide some private space for our sisters and parents. The apartments were separated by eight foot high partitions, high enough for visual, but not auditory separation. So needless to say, most of the evacuees spoke in whispers or low voices, except for the babies whose cries could be heard throughout the barrack. Meals were served cafeteria style, except that we didn't have a choice of offerings we ate wh whatever was served. If liver and beans was our dinner, we knew our choice was to eat it or go hungry until breakfast. The food allowance for each person was supposed to be 45 cents a day, but in actual less. The quality of food improved in later years. We started a camp farm and fresh vegetables were grown for our own consumption. Amachi had a hospital, a dispensary. The staff was primarily Japanese American, but the chief doctor and head nurse were Caucasian. Amachi had schools. At first, there were no school buildings. 
education took to the block, blocks in unheated barracks. The benches were used for sitting, no school desks, few textbooks. Student school supply, excuse me, <coughs> trying to get over a cold here. Student su school supplies were almost non-existent. Our teachers were very lot, a few Quakers, some retired teachers, some conscientious objectors, the inexperienced evacuees. I remember my algebra teacher was an evacuee who had been a cartoonist for Walt Disney Studios prior to entering camp. We learned to draw cartoons, but didn't learn too much math. In 1943, a, a year later, a real school was built to accommodate junior high and high school students. Amachi High even had a gymnasium and a library. It didn't take us long to develop a school similar to those on the outside. We had a student council, class officers, student clubs, intramural sports teams, school dances, etc., etc. We even had a newspaper and produced a yearbook. The only difference between the school on the outside and Amachi High was the student population, which was almost all Japanese American. Of course, Jim was a graduate of that. Outside of school, there wasn't a whole lot to do to occupy the leisure time. The children played games, quarreled, played more games. The oldest evacuees sat on benches outside the barracks, talking, just talking, day after day. Some people got jobs. Someone had to do the work around camp, the cooking, the cleaning, the nursing, the construction work, the farm labor, the teaching, etc., etc. Pay was meager. $8 a month for unskilled work, $12 a month for skilled work, $16 a month for professional workers like doctors, management personnel. Later, the pay was raised to $19 a month. At age 15, I finally got a summer job unloading lumber from railroad boxcars. My pay was $8 a month. That $2 a week, 40 cents a day, 5 cents an hour. I thought I was lucky to have a job. As you heard last week, some of the young men joined the Army. Some young women did too. Others left the camp to resume college careers. Some left the camps to help harvest crops. Some left camp to try to find work in the Midwest or the East Coast. Persons leaving term concentration camp, so they euphemistically named them relocation centers, but arose by any other name, it still arose. They were not death camps like Dachau or Auschwitz. The Jews have a word for what happened, the Holocaust. Sometimes I wish we had a similar word to capture the essence of what happened to us. Someone said it was a human tragedy. Another simply called it a mistake. Eugene Rostow, a Yale law professor, said it was a disaster. Somehow none of these words seem to capture the essence of our experience. In 1942, Eleanor Roosevelt said, quote, I cannot bear to think of children behind barbed wire looking out at a free world, only of course the world that they live in is not free." Unquote. She was referring to children in Nazi concentration camps. How ironic and how sad. One fourth of the evacuees in American concentration camps were children under the age of 15. And we were there because her husband Franklin D. Roosevelt had put camps. Well, my ten, ten minutes is up. Sally would have said my would have said that my ten minutes were up ten minutes ago. So thank you for your indulgence, and we're open to questions. As, as I said. <laughs> uh, can I just make a comment that you? Um, alluded to a while back about privacy in the camps. My husband, uh, who's sitting over there, that guy over there, <laughs> um, and I were newlyweds in camp, and so you can imagine what that lack of privacy was then. 
let me add one other thing, too. Uh, last week, um, the panel was composed of people of, of, of the um, 522nd uh, attached to the 442nd. Sure. Uh, no, no, I don't know about protest writing. I do know that, that uh, when it came time to, to be drafted for the Army, you know, eventually we were drafted out of the camps, um, there, were, there were some resistors. Heart Mountain, for, for example, had 126 resistors, 40 of whom were put into prison. They just said, hey, you know, until, until uh, you set us free, we're just not going to volunteer for your army, no matter what. Oh, I think that's a very interesting question. And in uh, the context of what happens today, it's, it, it's, it seems, but at that time, given uh, the, the, our states of mind, I mean, that would probably have been the furthest thing uh, from what we wanted to do. Thank you. Yeah, by and large, the um, general public was stirred up to the point of uh, getting the Japs out of California or the West Coast. But there were a lot of good people that helped us. And, uh, uh, you know, um, helped us because we were human beings. Our farm was taken care of uh, by a... Um, uh, a fine individual in Santa Rosa named Mr. Cecil Rowe. And the same story is repeated throughout the West Coast that there were people who uh, assisted us. Uh, uh, hmm? Service, committee. Service committee. I've forgotten. I'm sorry. I stayed with the Quaker family in Philadelphia after I graduated from school. and. Uh, uh, I should remember that because they assisted a lot of college students to enroll in uh, colleges along with the uh, uh, United Church of Christ organization, I think the Methodists, I think, and also the, the uh, Protestant organizations grouped together and assisted the, the college students to further their education. At the time of the protest, so there was very little outcry on, from, the, from the public at large. I mean, all the newspapers like the San Francisco Chronicle and Tribune and you know, Sacramento Bee and others were, were violently against uh, us. Were there, in the camps, were there incidents of uh, physical abuse, either personal or in group, by the American guards, et cetera? There were some. Um, some people were shot. Uh, you get too close to the fence, for example, and you get shot. Uh, one of the sad things that, that happened this past week was Cesar Chavez died. But for a long time, I boycotted the, the, the grapes. And uh, when we went to the camps in, in uh, Merced, California, in the fairgrounds, the land right outside the fence were vineyards with you know, Thompson seedless grapes, and they're getting ripe, and I wanted to have some grapes, uh, but they just couldn't, couldn't reach them. There was a road, and the road was patrolled by, uh, by Jeep uh, patrols, and of course the sentry towers overhead would, uh, I mean, were, armed, were, were uh, occupied, and, and sentries would shoot us, and at night the searchlights would come back and forth, and you know, you sort of think, well, I can time the searchlights, and I can get under the fence, and I just, just a handful of grapes, but I never got any. I was just too scared. I mean, you would get shot. But I remember in, in one of the camps, some guy got some, an evacuee got too close to the camp fence. He got shot.
I think that the cruelty and the abuse that occurs in a situation like that is really psychological. Uh, just being in a place be, um, because you are a certain, uh, you have a certain kind of face, uh, it's something that you can't help, it does real damage. I remember that when I uh, first went out of camp to join my husband, who was in, by then in the... I went to the train and I felt as though I had this big J, you know, across my chest. I am this Japanese person who, and I was very, very conscious of that. Uh, and I think that that shows uh, the kind of uh, damage that that can do. Oh, I, I agree with the Aleuts. They, uh, uh, they, were, they were put into uh, terrible um, situations in the, in the southeast uh, Alaska into fishing camps, and uh, they had to live under terrible conditions. Uh, as to the uh, didn't, they didn't speak up for us at all. Well, uh, you know, at the, at, the, at the time the war broke out here on the mainland, contiguous 48, uh, there were uh, 126,000 Japanese Americans in the United States. 126,000, that's a little bit more than the population of Santa Rosa. And, uh, but uh, the great majority lived here in, in uh, California. Uh, and uh, Oregon and Washington. I mean, that's where people came in from Japan. So it's natural that they would be here on the West Coast. So of that 126,000, 112,000 in the depths. Of that 112,000, about 90% lived here in California. Men who oh, uh, the question is, what happened to the three men? Um, let me see. Uh, Korematsu uh, was one of the uh, those men who refused to go to the camp because he had an interest in 
a, a woman and decided that that was stronger than his desire to go to camp. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the other two uh, did it on principle, uh, used to go. And in fact, one of them, uh, Gordon Korematsu, made a big issue out of it to uh, the law and said, here I am, you, you should arrest me because I'm not going to go to the camps. And uh, he ended up sort of taking himself to jail because nobody else would, would uh, do that. Uh, he was a very, I think, very much of a hero uh, to a lot of people for doing that. And I think they've all been vindicated. You know, uh, at one point in time, they, all of this was declared unconstitutional. George? Gordon here, but I should, you know, his brother lives here in, in uh, Glen Ellen. Um, but those were interesting cases. Uh, one was Min Yasui, who was a lawyer, attorney in Portland, Oregon. And he said, I'm not observed this curfew business, you know. You know, we had a curfew on whereby from 8 o'clock in the evening till 6 in the, in the, uh, the morning, uh, we were not to be seen on the streets uh, if we lived in the cities. And so uh, he, uh, he said, uh, uh, hey, that's unconstitutional. He wandered up and down the streets of Portland uh, telling the, the police that, hey, you know, please arrest me for the residence halls. So he said, I, I'm just not going to do it. Back here. Escape? Well, you have to remember where we were. We, we were out in desert areas, first of all, and uh, the, the, uh, the conditions were very, very, um, were not conducive to, to, uh, to escape. And second, all you have to do is, is go outside and, and, and uh, there weren't Japanese faces out there. Uh, they just take one look at us and say, hey, th those, those people are from that so-called Jap camp. And, uh, then uh, uh, rules relaxed a lot. And uh, by the end of the uh, camp experience, we were able to just about uh, talk Japanese. And the women were doing things like, uh, flower arranging and uh, things like that. You also have to remember that, that right after Pearl Harbor, within uh, after Pearl Harbor, most of the leaders in the Japanese American communities were picked up. If you were a, a, a leader in the Buddhist church, you were picked up. You know, this is by the FBI. If you were a leader in the organization. I mean, they had a lot of different kinds of organizations. They were picked up. So that about 3,000 uh, leaders of the Japanese community were picked up. It's no wonder we had no voice out there to speak out. I mean, to provide any leadership for us. I mean, most, most of the leadership came from a Nisei group uh, whose average age was maybe 20 years old. No, I think there are more questions oh, out sure. there. I think you've adequately answered it. It really wasn't that, uh, uh, it wasn't a, let's put it this way, it's not an atypical experience. Uh, there were many who lost their farms. Uh, my uh, father um, bought the farm in my oldest sister's name, and therefore it was a property of a U.S. citizen and not in his name, even though he was a guardian and he was running the farm. Um, there were many, uh, cases in which uh, people lost their farms entirely. Uh, but by the same token, there were all 
large uh, farms which were taken care of in the Central Valley, especially around the Livingston uh, Merced area in which uh, there was uh, a, uh, uh, a good citizen, I think his name was Gordon Whitten, I think. But at any rate, he took care of the cooperative and in fact, he would come to Amache, Colorado, in which many of the uh, uh, farm owners were incarcerated from the Livingston area and come report to them that uh, uh, what the the crops did that year and so on. Uh, 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 there were those who did, uh, who managed to retain their property, uh, you know, through the years of incarceration. Others uh, were not so fortunate. They lost everything, including their farm, because they had no way to uh, dispose of some of the equipment, the livestock, and so forth. No, I, I think <laughs> there were some uh, very unscrupulous practices, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, practiced against the landowners. In one way or the other, they had their property taken away. They didn't pay their taxes. They couldn't pay their taxes, for one thing. And so uh, they lost the property because of non-payment of taxes, and it was sold on the basis of that. So uh, we lost our farm. Uh, we had a week. Uh, we, the notice went up, and a week later we were to report to the center. So uh, what can you do in a week? I mean, here you are. You know, we had 20 acres. We had farm implements. We had you know uh, everything. And we lost everything. What, what happened was a high school teacher who, who knew the situation offered to buy our farm. Uh, he gave us six thousand dollars, and so he got he got this farm with a really nice stucco house that's still there, uh, and the peach and or uh, walnut crop and a tractor and everything. We sold our new pickup for $250. Uh, you got what you could, and you didn't wait for other offers. People just came by and said, you know, this and this, and give you ridiculous offers, and you said, sure. What else are you gonna do? So we had no place to come back to when, we, when camp ended. We ended up in, in Greece. No. Well, he should have been put in a concentration camp. Uh, there were 2,000 Germans put into a internment camp down in Crystal City, Texas, along with some Japanese American leaders, you know, Buddhist, Buddhist priests, uh, language te uh, uh, teachers, along with Peruvian Japanese. And they had one Italian family in there, too. Uh, Hey, uh, even today, uh, I don't think you'll find any of us getting on a soapbox. <clears throat> uh, and th that's just against our, you know, cultural value system. We're known as the quiet Americans. Uh, but I, I would like to respond to the gentleman who indicated that uh, the conditions were different in Hawaii in that the, the, uh, uh, the rich... Um, how all the uh, landowners over there wished to keep the labor there in the islands, so there was an economic issue there. Uh, what I 
meant to mention during the time that I showed the slides that I'm almost positive that the evacuation that occurred uh, here in, on the wet, mainland United States was economically oriented towards because the Japanese Americans, farmers were becoming so uh, very uh, good at what they were doing and uh, they were becoming, uh, you know, vast landowners and so forth. So I'm almost positive that, you know, I can't prove it, but that's, uh, I've always felt that it was economically oriented. One, we'll take one more, one more question. Yes. Yes. Uh, when when they picked them, picked the leaders up, uh, right after Pearl Harbor. Uh, they, the FBI would show up at the door, pick them up, and off they'd go, and they wouldn't tell. We'll, we'll stay around to answer questions, uh, but in closing, we'd like to thank you again for the opportunity. As, as a former Holocaust survivor, Frida Fromm Krieger stated so eloquently when she talked about her vivid experiences, and I quote, now with little time left, I fear that my mission has not been fulfilled. As I look around me, I see eyes that refuse to see, and I hear those that refuse to listen. I'm faced with denial and fear of the truth. And that was from a Holocaust survivor. Thanks again for coming. Thank you so much. I can't, uh, I'm torn. I don't know whether to say it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to get acquainted with you and hear you. I mean, what was going on in between December and May? Was that the current Yeah, you're talking about the leaders, I understand. The majority of people, in turn, they started in a way.